everyone, welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, a podcast for all disciplines, pads, players, and game masters, and enthusiasts like Josh and myself. I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things mosaical, because we're going to tie in like five or six different topics that just aren't long enough for the, oh, their own episode. So we're going to throw as many options at the players and game masters as we possibly can think of, just to make sure we've covered them all before we get into other major topics. So this is the mosaic episode. We're going to talk about things like piecemeal armor, chain casting, raising your free talents, combat training mounts, and other things. So uh, if you have any questions for us about anything we did not cover in this episode or things you'd like to hear us talk about in the future, contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. I think we just start with piecemeal armor because it's... Sure. A lesser known thing, and I think it's one of the things that really does kind of flesh out the difference in Earth Dawn from other fantasy games is even though I'm going to piecemeal my armor, it doesn't necessarily dictate where I get hit and how my armor <laughs> protects me necessarily. So it's more, it's, it still provides a overall general physical defense or physical yeah. armor rating. Sorry. Most games don't really do hit locations yeah and i say that and i'm like well hold on deadlands (laughs) did (laughs) rollmaster did Mm -hmm. so there there are games that do yeah i i there are games that that handle hit locations where you might want to know how armored any particular piece is earth dawn is not one of those games the mechanics don't really lend themselves to the game is not written with that kind, with that level of simulation Spec- in mind when it comes to the combat yeah. rules. Yeah. Not that kind of specific specificity. So the purpose of the piecemeal armor rules, which were originally introduced in first edition. Mm-hmm. I forget exactly what book, but it was related to the trolls. So I it think was it was Skyrim's probably book. in. Was it really that far along? I thought they, I no, thought that no, it no, got no. introduced I'm earlier. I'm sorry. It was in the Denizens of Earth on volume two. Okay. So it was, Patrol, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I would have thought. Sorry. Obviously, you know, with the phenomenal show prep research that we do ahead of time, <laughs> did not bother to actually grab the book and look to see if that was the not case. this week, not this, but week. no show prep this week. week, but they were introduced because of the idea that trolls being large might mm-hmm. not necessarily be able to find full suits of armor, particularly heavier armor that mm-hmm. would fit them. And for the Sky Raiders, the Crystal Raiders especially, would be looking at pieces that they could scavenge and, and find from raids and various other things so that they might have a breastplate, a, like a sleeve or like leather armor equivalent on their legs or something along those lines. Yeah. The general idea being that you could get bits and pieces of armor would still protect you and still provide armor protection, Mm -hmm. but that you would not be able to get as much protection from only pieces of armor as you would from a full suit. Yeah. You you did. You tied, you tied all that together. You're good. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was mentally diagramming uh, the sentence at the end. They're going, did I? Yeah, that, that was what I meant to say. <laughs> yes. No, you're good. So it's, it's like having a, you know, chain mail on a certain part of your body and plate mail over here. But there are some things you cannot actually incorporate into that, like blood pebble and yeah. living crystal because blood don't pebble, come living crystal. I don't remember whether fern weave was one that was al- allowable to be, piecemealed like that probably not because i think fern weave is kind of the same piecemeal no, armor no, is one of is those things piecemeal chart the piecemeal uh armor table actually does include fern weave does it okay on there yeah, that's, fair, skin, that's fair bark crystal weave so yeah all kinds of things are on there just living crystal and blood pebble are not available in piecemeal armor but And there's a whole rubric on mathematics to get the large body size, medium body size, and small body size to work and what the armor ratings are, physical, uh, mystic, and then initiative. But I figure it adds a nice little wrinkle. Sure. The general idea is that a full suit of armor takes up a certain number of pieces, of slots, 
and that you can piecemeal pieces together to make, in theory, yeah. if you take all of the pieces that make up a full suit of the same type, it should be equivalent to mm -hmm. getting a full suit of that type, because that's kind of how the math works. Yeah. But it actually doesn't quite, because the idea is that piecemeal armor is not going to be as effective because the pieces were not made to go together. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely something that you can use for the most part for style, for flash, for appearance. There's nothing that, that really requires you to do anything with it. But if you want to have a visual where you've got a pauldron and arm piece of plate Mm -hmm. But you've otherwise got like a leather or or chain shirt and maybe leather greaves or something. Yeah. That you can do that and it's going to provide protection, but you don't need to. The whole point of the piecemeal armor is to provide you with what your equivalent sort of armor thing is to abstract out how much defense you have. Yeah. If you wanted to go the whole route of, well, now we're going to use hit locations and keep track of where you're hit and you need to know what type of armor you've got on the different parts of your body because that's going to affect the damage differently. That's fair and fine if you want to do that. But again, the rules, that. broadly speaking, designed to kind of handle that level of simulation in terms of combat and hit locations and stuff. Yeah, I figure it's a nice way if your if your players are constantly running out of money, but they need armor, then they have to scavenge what they can find, maybe from their opponents. This is not a bad way to work some of that stuff in. Just another little little wrinkle for the, the maybe the the player character to, you know, again piecemeal their funds together. To, I can get I can steal the the pants off of that guy <laughs> now that he's dead and those are wyvern skin i can wear those and i found this guy over here only wearing you know the top half of uh stone disc armor i can combine that as well you know and there's a way to get that done so it's good for aesthetics it's also maybe kind of good to help tie in the story if the game master wants to make armor a little harder to find just, just but it otherwise is completely optional and able to be ignored if one so chooses yeah, I just it was different than most uh, fantasy games as a as a something to provide. So I thought we'd include it because we hadn't talked about it before, and it's not long enough to do a whole episode on. Look, that took us seven minutes. We're done. Episode over. Just kidding. Uh, okay, <laughs> short one for you this week, folks. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's that's good for a trip to the bathroom. Uh, so let's go on to the other options that are listed in the companion. So if you don't have the earth on companion, you're a missing out. There's a whole bunch of things in there for the further development of your character, but a couple of little, little things that you may not know exist like chain casting. This sounds yeah. new for fourth edition. This sounds like it's, it doesn't ring a bell to me from previous editions, but I wasn't playing a, a spellcaster recently. Yeah. That's because it is in a sense hey, new for fourth edition. It's the first real codification of such a thing gotcha. uh, in terms of providing guidelines. One of the things with regards to Earth Dawn magicians, to spellcasters, mm -hmm. as we have discussed the many, many times that we have discussed them, yes. is that there is no limit to how many times they can cast a spell that they know. Yeah, not per day, not per hour. If they've got the spell in their matrix, they can continue to cast it as often as they like, mm -hmm. as long as they are willing to do so. Ad nauseum. Logistically, what this means is that, in theory, it is possible for a defensive spell, like, say, air armor, mm -hmm. for an elementalist to always sort of have that spell cast on their group. Oh, it lasts so long. Every 10 minutes, every 8 minutes, however long it is, we yeah. stop and I recast the spell so that we always have this spell available on us. Yes. Realistically, there there's nothing in the story, in the setting that would necessarily prevent that, aside from the annoyance of, oh, <laughs> it's time for us to stop and get our air armor get our, spell get our mojo back in. going, yeah. Oh, we're going to make the, basically like, well, the journey is, like, it takes you three hours to get there. Okay, I now want, if you want the spell to be of act 
available the whole time. Mm-hmm. I'm going to need you to make a spell casting roll at like like 48 spell casting rolls for each time <laughs> that you would have needed to cast the spell during. Yeah. Yeah. Like a yeah, whole lot of unnecessary. Minutes, 36 rolls. Oh, I don't know how to do 36 rolls. I love rolling dice, but there's a there's a limit. Yeah, but it's also not it's not doing anything like there's no there's nothing interesting that's going on with that. Yeah. Right. If you generally speaking, minutes, yeah, and as I have gotten older, I am generally of the opinion that you really should tend to be rolling dice when the consequences or results of failure are as interesting or potentially interesting as success. Yeah. And in combat, obviously, that's always kind of the case because you've got damage and various other stuff kind of going on all the time. Mm-hmm. But outside of combat, it's a little bit less... Yeah, and since there there aren't really any critical fumble situations like we've talked about with spellcasters, if they have mm-hmm. the time, if they are not under pressure, they can do just about anything that their spells allow. Yeah. So the chain casting rules are basically okay. If you are going to be allowing this thing that should be doable within the setting, if you are going to allow your players to do that. Mm-hmm. Then here are the restrictions that we recommend that you put in place as a result of that. One of those being if they're going to have a buff spell, if they're going to have a defensive spell, if they're going to have some kind of effect like that, that they want to keep up, they need to have that spell in the matrix because they need to have it ready to cast safely whenever it lapses and they want to do it. Yeah, so it's not raw magic. It's not casting for grimoire. It has to t- it has to occupy space in one of your matrices. One of your matrices. One of your matrices. Yes. Yeah, and then it also, also it also generally requires. We also require that you not need to weave any threads to cast it, mm-hmm. because weaving the threads is an extra action, and that yep. basically means that's even more time that you would be spending preparing and casting the spell as opposed to actually traveling or doing whatever it is in that situation. Yeah. Now, fortunately, most of the low circle spells that you would kind of want to have available all the time mm-hmm. tend to be zero or one thread. Yeah. You know, and one threads aren't a problem once you get into journeyman and can have that in a, an enhanced matrix. But basically, again, just to kind of like, let's be realistic here. If it actually takes notable amount of time to prepare Mm -hmm. and cast the spell every time it lapses, then you need to take that into account. Yeah. And also it needs to have a duration of minutes or greater. Longer. Yeah. Because otherwise it lapses so quickly that basically you're casting it every minute, every 30 seconds, every 60 seconds, every 70 seconds, whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. That's all sorts of time that you're spending casting as opposed to the other activities that you are presumably doing that your casting would be interrupting. That's the general gist, which is really there's not a notable reason why people with certain spells would not have those spells available if they are adventurers Mm -hmm. and going into a situation where they expect to be facing danger. If you are going to be exploring the ruins of Parlanth, it would make sense that you would want to have air armor up as much as you could so that if you get (laughs) ambushed or caught in a trap or any other kind of situation where that would be useful, it's handy. It also does help alleviate one of the more common complaints about magicians in fourth edition, but also in general, which is that we get into a fight. I need to spend the first one or two or three rounds Mm -hmm. buffing my allies, casting monstrous mantle or doing these things to them, which is contributing, but it doesn't feel like I'm contributing the way that say a warrior is by stabbing things with pointy bits of metal. Yes. Magician people, magicians do still want to be able to be casting damage spells and so forth. So if they have a mechanism by which they can have those enhancement spells one of them or something like that ready ahead mm-hmm. of time, yeah. then that allows them to quote unquote, get into the action a little bit more quickly, which yeah. is fine. I can understand that standpoint. The legends of earth on game has used chain casting, chain casting to great mm-hmm. effect. Air armor is a pretty standard thing that we've got going on. 
Um, even yeah. where we're at in in mid to upper journeyman circles at this point, air armor mm-hmm. is still kind of a standard chain cast thing we've got going on. Virag actually does not chain cast anything. Yeah. Just because of the vagaries of Nethermancer spells, <laughs> there are other things that I want to have in handy in my matrices. Yeah. And the beneficial spells are more situational to a certain extent. Mm-hmm than elementalist or some wizard spells and things like that. Yeah. So Fair. I think chain casting is, is nice. It's a nice addition just to take care of the minutiae. You know, it also is like, because we're not making you roll, we're, you know, the assumption is that you just get a basic success out of it. You don't get any kind of enhanced effect unless it's part of the normal. It's normally a zero thread spell, but you're in a, uh, an enhanced matrix. So you do get the effect of one thread if you want. Yeah. Stuff like that. And you can't, you cannot put karma on this chain cast spell. Right. Cause you'd run out of karma. It's just basically like, okay, if we are going to hand wave the fact that you are going to be casting this spell over and over again, every 15 minutes, every 20 minutes or however long it is. Yeah. Then you're going to need to accept some limitations on that, which is you're just getting simple successes. You're not able to spend karma on it. If you want the potential of getting those higher successes, then mm-hmm. you will actually need to make the test at the time and and let the dice determine what happens. Yeah, fair. Okay, so we've covered piecemeal armor and some chain casting. So kind of piecemeal for everybody, chain casting for the magicians. Let's get into the Beastmasters because we they don't get as much love as they possibly should. And there's a whole page and a half or so on combat training, your mount, or cavalrymen, I'm sorry, cavalrymen, not Beastmasters. What was I thinking? I'm well, <laughs> Beastmasters also get animal training and stuff like that and would yes. be in, potentially involved in making an animal companion trained for combat. Yeah, so they can help. So this it was is... Just, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, so this was just one of those little rules of uh, cavalrymen don't get as much love as they should, uh, and Beastmasters can help, and so always the, well, how do I train this companion of mine or yours into being, you know, this fearsome mounted uh, combatant as well? And so there's a progression that has to take place there. So this is the little section that covers that for all of uh, all of you who may have been wondering. Sure. And the general gist of it is that training a mount or other annual companion for combat is considered a certain number of tricks for the purposes of the animal training talent mm-hmm. or skill. And that's basically what it involves. And so it's something that needs to be sort of done initially, especially if you're dealing with a a non-domesticated animal. Mm -hmm. This is sort of an enhancement or explanation or additional detail mechanics for handling that for those who want a little bit more specificity or structure in terms of how that works. Yeah, it's basically... Because the creature power of willful comes into play if you're trying to get them to do something that they don't naturally necessarily want to do. And so you have to work on your um, interaction tables with that mount and they get to roll willful and so forth. So it's a, it's a little negotiation process with that animal companion slash mount to get that level to where you'd like it to be. So it's not impossible. It's just going to take you some effort and some time. So it's good for down. It's good for downtime role playing. It's good for uh, circling up your character that time as well. Um, obviously, it can't be done in combat, but it's just something to enhance the storyline for you as a beastmaster or a cavalryman to get that animal to be what you want it to be eventually, and get that companionship and mount part working for possible combat later on. Right. And the willful isn't actually something that's rolled. It's just a modifier to the number of tricks or commands that it requires to take. Mm -hmm. The basic idea is that the tier of the creature as given in the Game Master's Guide or Companion, Mm -hmm. whether novice, journeyman tier, whatever, determines sort of the base number of command slots that's required. And if they have willful, then that adds a Modifiers. Additional modifiers makes it more 
difficult. Challenging. Yeah, fair. So I figured we'd bring that up just because I know cavalrymen and Beastmasters are kind of particular about their creatures that they're traveling with. And that's always a question. Always, always, always a question. How can I improve them? How can I get them to be what I want them to be? I want you know the, my mount to do this. There's a process for it. It's in the companion. If you don't have the companion book, you're missing out. So on to something else that might be a little bit of a minutiae that people don't know about that players can do. You can raise the ranks of your free talents above your circle. However... It is something that we provide as an option, yes. <laughs> yes. One of the drawbacks of having made some talents into free talents, which is to say that they advance without you needing to spend any legend points on them, mm -hmm. is that within the reality of the fiction, within the reality of the game setting, they would be another magical ability that the adept had, just like one of their normal talents. And there's nothing necessarily that would prevent them from working harder on that. There are kind of a lot of assumptions that go along with things in the same way that karma is based off of circle. The durability is now purely based off of circle rather than being a talent. The free talents now being based off of a circle that generally speaking, people raising talents significantly above their circle mm -hmm. tends to actually be rare from a numbers efficiency standpoint. Mm -hmm. There are certain things, particularly ones that are more thematic or viewed in, in a way as legend point sinks mm -hmm. in some regards, which is to say something that points needed to be spent on that you didn't necessarily need to spend accurate or not that's the the perception of some of these things but mm -hmm. perhaps a weaponsmith wants to increase their craftsmen their their magical yeah. craftsman abilities above being equal to their circle or a mm -hmm. thief wants to have danger sense higher than their circle the free spell matrices there's no real advantage to increasing them higher than your circle because of the restrictions on what spells you can place in your matrices yeah I mean, yeah, if you're a second circle wizard, you want to increase one of your free matrices to rank three. In theory, you can do that with these rules, but you can't put a third circle matrix, a spell into a matrix while you're a second circle wizard. It just doesn't work. Yeah. It's one of the, the restrictions on them. So there's not much point in doing it. But there may be cases or people who want to, and mm -hmm. increasing free talent ranks is sort of the mechanism by which you can do that which is essentially you pay the legend point cost as if you were buying it as a novice talent to the rank that you are getting it to. Yeah. And then at that point, when you increase your circle, mm -hmm. there are a couple of different options that the game master can provide in terms of what <laughs> happens to those points. Three, in fact. Option number one, the legend points that they spent on the talent are refunded, so they could then spend them or mm -hmm. whatever. That's a nice game master to refund your points yeah. that way. There's the points that they spend count as credit towards, they are refunded, but only in the sense that you could then put those points towards buying the next rank up mm -hmm. if you wanted to. So if, if you, you had previously spent 300 away. and the next one's five, then you really would only need to spend two. Yeah. It's a little bit more limited. And then of course there's the option of, yeah, you spent them and now they're gone tough. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me as a game master. That is an option that, certainly some people would not be fond of certainly people who don't like the idea of wasting legend points mm -hmm. probably would maybe not be inclined towards doing this anyway, Yeah, fair. but it is an option. And there are a couple of different ways that you can handle it. Yeah. So I figured we'd bring that up. We have, yeah, we're about 27 minutes into our podcast here. I think we have time to do two or three more topics real quick. So for, Character, players to flesh out their character a little bit more, uh, one more section right after this one as well, raising your free talent ranks, is a talent crisis. Yes. So this is, this is an interesting little wrinkle in the game. This is something to provide mechanical teeth to a role-playing aspect. Yes. Um, this was introduced way back in the Adept's Way, the first edition book. Mm-hmm which really highlighted and focused on the idea of an adept was following a 
mystical, philosophical path that allowed them to unlock their magical potential and to use and to access the magic available to them as a follower of a certain discipline. Yeah. That philosophy, that underlying core of belief that allows them to do what they do carries with it certain restrictions and taboos Mm -hmm. in terms of that if they do not behave in a manner in line with their philosophy of the discipline, then the magic will not work as well or potentially may not work at all. This is something that if you've read The Longing Ring is a big aspect of Jerol's character arc during that novel. Yeah. Where he is initiated into the thief (coughs) discipline with a certain philosophy that is Garl Thick's sort of way of the selfish thief. Mm -hmm. And that any time that he is thinking about other people or not acting in his own self-interest, then the magic doesn't work for him. And as a novice, as an initiate, as a first circle thief, that can cause some problems for him. And generally speaking, following a discipline, and we kind of talk about this a little bit in the player's guide, Mm -hmm. you should have an idea of how you are going to behave and, and certain disciplines tend to behave certain ways because those behaviors tend to be in line with the most common philosophies that allow them to do what they do. Yeah. Not that they're the only ways, but they're the more common ways, right? The, mm-hmm. the idea of the troubadour being a performer or historian or artistic craftsman of some flavor or variety, you're not very likely to have a troubadour that is not going to be a performer in some regard. Mm-hmm. And so if they act in ways counter to that philosophy, then the magic can fail them. And this is a mechanical system that reinforces that notion. Yeah. If you're going to be using it, you need to have your players define actions that are in line or not in line with their discipline. And if they act counter to that philosophy that they have described, Mm -hmm. then depending on how severely they are breaking that stricture, they suffer penalties to their talents. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's not a cudgel or a rod of player control. It's a... <laughs> it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. I generally don't... I, I don't believe that it should be used in that way. Fair. I think that it's something that for people who like to have a little bit more mechanical reinforcement of certain role-playing ideas and themes, mm-hmm. want to use this to enhance a character arc or a story where they might want to be playing through their character having a crisis of conscience, of, of struggling with their path, uh, things like that, mm-hmm. and having a sort of little bit of a mechanical reinforcement of that, I think that, that this could help. But it is absolutely, I think, optional, in part because of the dangers that I see with regards to abuse. If you have a game mm-hmm. master who is being a little bit more of a um, stickler fist banging on the table, kind of dictatorial Mm -hmm. individual, as opposed to being a co-player, being a guide, being a a partner in the Mm -hmm. story that is being told and is using it to enforce a particular role play attitude or style onto their players. Mm Mm-hmm. That is a failure not of the talent crisis system. That is a failure that has developed a lot earlier than that in the Game Master's own attitude in a failure of communication or misunderstanding of of a lack of session zero and planning and whatnot between the player who maybe has a particular point of view about the way that their character sees their discipline and pursues that philosophy Mm -hmm. and the view that the game master has most commonly when you have somebody who takes a very literalist and prescriptivist view of the discipline philosophy oh well this is the way that it was described in the adept's way Mm -hmm. you are not following that path therefore you are doing it wrong and i'm going to penalize you for it (laughs) that's not what this is intended for fair I figured I'd bring it up because just in case somebody wanted to help flesh out their character a little bit more 
or define some rough aspects of their character a little bit more narrowly, this would be helpful to them to do so. To potentially. understand that it's there. Yeah, potentially. It's a potential yeah. thing. I personally don't have a reason to do it for my character, but you know, I'm only fourth circle. I haven't quite figured them all out yet, but I'm working on it. So we'll get from that from the from point A to point Z eventually. Okay, the last two things I think we should bring up because we got about a half an hour to cover these, since the episodes we're going to be getting, getting into here pretty soon are the warden and the master tier talent levels for everybody else, are the training pledge, and if we can get to, get time to cover it in the ghost master, yeah. So these are some interesting aspects because uh, reading the training pledge again, I'm reminded that this is a very large part of who the the character is going to become is who they get to train them, how they get to learn it. And if they want to stop paying money for it and actually dedicate themselves to one specific trainer, the training pledge is how to get that done. And this goes all the way back to first edition. Yeah. It is a way to get that done. The default advancement method provided in the player's guide Mm -hmm. in the building your legend chapter is that when you have the appropriate talents at the right ranks, to qualify for advancement to the next circle, you find a trainer of that circle or higher, pay them some money, spend some time, and they train you and initiate you into the next circle of your discipline. And you move on. <laughs> Mechanically speaking, it is relatively straightforward. I think there is lots of opportunity, um, especially if you can get recurring NPCs. Mm-hmm. You can certainly have that silver cost be replaced by favors or various other things. There's opportunity for role-playing and character exploration and all kinds of cool stuff that go along with training and advancement. Yes. You know, we're not going to dwell on that too much. Not too much. But that is not the only way to do it. Another way to do that, and this is one that is a little bit more mystical and leans a little bit more into the idea of disciplines as mystery cults of a sort, disciplines as traditions that are handed down from master to apprentice and so on down through Mm -hmm. the the generations, which is why you have adepts of the the same discipline tending to behave the same way and having the same broad beliefs and things like that. Yeah. And that is that rather than making the training transactional, rather than have it be something that is a, Tradition. a simple exchange of, of services. Mm-hmm. There is an oath. There is a mystical, magical ritual of a sort that is done where the prospective student yeah. swears themselves to follow the teachings and philosophies of their master. There's a stronger bond developed yeah. in doing this. Instead of making it, as you said, transactional, this is a deeper, more meaningful bond of right. teacher-student relationship. And it's not something that is entered into casually, <laughs> because there are some teeth that go along with it that some people don't like mm-hmm. because of the potential downside there. One more time. <laughs> the student asks to take the pledge, and once asked, the potential master cannot do a whole lot to actually dissuade the student. Mm-hmm. They are not obligated necessarily to do so. Yeah. I mean, the, the master would take the oath as seriously as the student would be. Mm-hmm. A master being approached by someone trying to pick up, say, a second discipline or something like that, is not likely to be inclined towards doing the training pledge. Mm -hmm. There are circumstances under which I would certainly allow a master to deny a candidate if they were asked. Yeah. The candidate needs to provide an unenchanted or a calcum coin. Mm -hmm. Which could be a quest in and of itself, really. Which could be and likely would be a, a quest in and of itself. And that coin serves as the focus of the ritual that forms the pledge. Mm -hmm. The adept and the master swear oaths to each other that the master will train the student and the student will take those teachings and follow them and will keep the coin as a symbol of that pledge that they have made until they pass that coin along to their student. Yes. 
down the road. This is something that is not really described as such, but as I suspect something that is a much older tradition, going back to the long forgotten roots of how the disciplines came to be yeah. and things like that before it was all sullied with commerce. <laughs> the downside is if the student ever loses the coin and mm -hmm. does not recover it within a certain amount of time, they lose access to all of the circles that they might have gained while yeah. they studied under the effects of the pledge. Mm -hmm. There's a mystical aspect of the oath because they have broken that promise that they made to always keep the coin until they could pass it on, mm -hmm. that they could lose access to their magical abilities. And this is something that makes certain types of players nervous because it's a coin. It's a coin. It's an oracalcum coin. It's a valuable piece of, mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. I need to keep it on me, but I don't want it to get lost or stolen or whatever. Why would I possibly like all it takes is for the GM to be vindictive. Yeah. And have it get stolen and not allow me to recover it. And I'm now out all of the legend points that I sunk into mm -hmm. the talents that I acquired while under this oath. Yeah. Why would I do that? And my question is, well, apparently you wouldn't. Yes. I have a solution to that that I did a long, long time ago. My game master allowed me to have my coin implanted under my skin like blood pebble armor. A whole lot harder to steal. There's an item, I think it was in second edition, mm -hmm. that basically was that. It was like a blood magic pouch that would basically allow yeah. you to, to do that. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I think that like some other aspects of Earth Dawn. Yeah. I think that the training pledge is super flavorful and thematically Agreed. appropriate to some of the ideas that go along with disciplines and what they are kind of supposed to represent in terms of their role and place within Barsavian society and how they are a tradition that is passed down from master to student to master to student throughout the uncounted generations and why the various disciplines tend to follow various schools of thought. Yeah. But I can also recognize from a mechanistic game mechanics point of view, looking at it from outside is, yeah, there's a lot of weaknesses of this, you know, <laughs> in this system. So I can completely understand for, as well that point of view. And my feeling is, well, it's not required. You are perfectly free to continue finding somebody of the appropriate circle and paying the money to train you or developing relationships in other ways that they would train you without actually going into the whole thing of swearing a mystical oath. I also think that the pledge and the ritual of the ghost master mm -hmm. are methods of advancement that are going to be a lot more useful and a lot more likely when you start getting into those higher circles where there frequently are not very many adepts that are capable of teaching you the stuff that you want to know. It's possible for some disciplines that there aren't any that are still alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which brings us to the ritual of the ghost master. When you have a small population of adepts, I mean, there aren't a huge number of adepts to begin with. And the number of practitioners of any particular discipline is not going to be huge, mm -hmm. especially once you get into the higher circles. And we've talked about in the uh, companion, the early essays in the companion talk about that highest circle. And so they probably know of lost each you. other if they don't know each other personally. Mm -hmm. You are a lot less likely to find a 12th circle master who is willing to train you simply for the coin, you know, somebody who is that <laughs> famous probably doesn't yeah. need the money. And so is a lot more likely to require services or favors or whatever. And if you have mm -hmm. in the course of your adventures or whatever, kind of made them a rival in some sort, but they're the only person that's available who could teach you what you need to know. Yeah. Tough noogies. Yeah. There is role playing and story potential there, mm -hmm. but it is not something that is required because there are other methods. 
I, I found, <clears throat> so I, I want to ask you real quick on the development and the changes in the Ghostmaster ritual from first edition through now, because it used to just be a talent that you got, Ghostmaster ritual uh, at Fifth Circle, and now it's not, but I also think that it's something that you could lace in earlier if you wanted to, rather than just Fifth Circle, because now Fourth Edition has it as a talent knack. Yes. The Ghostmaster Ritual is look is uh, underneath the threadweaving talent. It's another case of looking at what something was and what role it kind of served and seeing mm-hmm. if there was a better way to handle it. The Ritual of the Ghostmaster was introduced very early in first edition. I think it's even in the, the core rulebook, if I'm remembering correctly, the first edition core rulebook, where talent knacks weren't yet a thing. Yes. It was a magical ability. It was something that was only available to adepts. Therefore, it had to be a talent. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's necessarily anything that requires it to be so. I think it's better off for talents to be a little bit more clear cut in terms of what they can do and Mm -hmm. to make special stuff knacks as much as possible because knacks are... They're not a core basic mechanic of the game. They are incredibly useful, and I highly recommend that people look at them and use them. They're an option. They they are the foundation around which paths are built. Yes. But they are not, strictly speaking, required in any way for you to to get the most out of your character and, and your discipline. No, it's an options. If you want to do the Ghostmaster ritual, then you go get the knack. Well, yeah, you, if you, you basically learn to how to do it, ritual, and that is tied don't. into, because the ritual is sort of unique to each discipline in a way, because you would be calling mm-hmm. up a past master of your discipline, then yeah. having that be a knack that is tied to thread weaving, which is sort of a catch-all of this is the representation of your character's connection to the magic of their discipline makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. It's what a rank five knack. I think so. Five or six ghost ritual. It's rank five. So in theory, unless you raise your thread weaving higher early on, you are still going to be mm-hmm. getting it around the same time that it was available previously, which is around Original. circle five. If you're yeah. going to be pursuing that, mm-hmm. but the ritual of the ghost master is very similar to the training pledge rather than a living person that you are taking the oath of, training with it's a dead one (laughs) it is a a past master of the discipline (coughs) you still need the the oracalcum coin you still need to take the Mm -hmm. oath in a sense and create that magical create that magical bond but a ghost master is not necessarily going to have the uh temporal obligations and requirements that uh, might come about as a result of a living master and as I mentioned, when yeah. you get really high in your, into your discipline, it may be that there aren't any living masters high enough for you to learn from if you want to continue advancing in your discipline. Or I've always had the, the problem with, okay, so you want to do the Ghostmaster ritual. Great. You're or, sorry. You want to do the training pledge. You, now that your adventure is over, you need to travel again to where your, to, where your trainer is. <laughs> Train with them because they're not going to come to you. And then come back to find your party again. So that travel has always been a little prohibitive. The Ghostmaster ritual means you get to take your teacher with you. Sort of, yeah. You get to conjure them whenever you need them. (laughs) So there is that ability. And learning the name of an appropriate Ghostmaster can be... Of a high enough Of of a high enough circle can be a quest objective all on its own. I mean, by the time that you're getting to the point where Ghostmasters are potentially required, you know, you're, you're Mm -hmm. dealing with very, very high circle characters typically. And like the regular training pledge, Ghostmaster ritual is something that is intensely flavorful and has a lot of potential to it, story Mm -hmm. potential, but is not again, strictly required in terms of the ability for a character to advance in their discipline, certainly throughout the, the first half of their career. Yeah, so if you're finding that you would like more flavor in your player's downtime as a game master, then you get to maybe create the adventure that they would go on, the quest that they would go on to A, find the coin that they need 
or have it created for them, take your pick, or f- mine the elements that they need to create the Oracalcum, have the Oracalcum coin created. I mean, there's a bunch of little side quests you could do there. Find the name, and then learn the knack, and you have all these little possibilities for creating all these little separate adventures for just that one character. And then if you have a party of four or five, multiply that by that number, and you have that many potential little adventures to have them run on to go get the coins, go get the names, go get the, you know, whatever they need. You can combine some of that together. You don't necessarily have to do each one individually. No, no, that's tedious. But you have all that possibility to create uh, the NPC that you need, the uh, adventure for them to go on and come back with and begin to develop that game master character teacher and by the way, you get to have fun recreating, you know, somebody who's 12th or 13th, 14th circle to teach them these things. And so you get to somewhat have your own little character to play at the same time as you're teaching them for all this downtime. So, yeah, I figured we'd cover all of that because, uh, as I said, we're going to get into the higher circle discipline talents here pretty soon for all of the ta- uh, disciplines in the game. And this is the nice introduction to, have you been using chain casting? Have you been fi- figured out how to work piecemeal armor into your group? Have you figured out uh, training your mounts or raising your free talent ranks or doing a talent crisis? These are the other little, other little things that can make up a full-fledged character persona. And now that we've done the training pledge and the Ghostmaster ritual, this is kind of leading us into the higher circles in the second half of the discipline paths anybody can play a couple of things here to wrap up this evening Go for just it. as a, a lead up if i'm remembering mm-hmm. our plans correctly episode 75 is going to be our episode about dragons yes this is episode 73 study... so our so we're a few... next recording session <coughs> is going to be the episode where we or is going to be the session where we record that episode so if you, have, if you questions. have questions, you will have probably a week or so between when this episode goes live and we do that recording. So if you have been sitting yeah. on questions related to dragons, send them to us. Some of you have. I will be posting, before this episode goes live, I will be posting to probably the, the guild and to Twitter as Twitter. a reminder about yeah. it. But as a reminder, if you have questions about dragons, you want to send mm-hmm. them in because that would be great to have those to help steer the discussion find out what people want us to talk about Mm -hmm. and what they want us to talk about that i will just you know slyly grin and not talk about because (laughs) i don't wanna can't make me so there's that but if you have any other questions not just about dragons but anything else whether stuff that we've covered today stuff that we have covered in the past Mm -hmm. stuff that we may cover in the future feel free to send us an email what is that email address dan EDSG podcast at gmail.com. I've actually got it memorized now, 73 episodes in. I don't need to look at my notes anymore. One other thing that I want to mention, I discovered that it's actually fairly easy to change one's Twitter ID. Yeah. For the longest time, the Twitter feed for the podcast was at Earth Dawn G. That has been changed as of a couple of weeks ago. It's updated to at EDSG podcast, which makes a lot more sense and will be easier for people to find (laughs) us. If you were already following the podcast on Twitter, that didn't change. You are you didn't you do not have to resubscribe. You do not have to find it. But if you were not, that's how you find it. I also took that opportunity to update my own personal Twitter feed. I had been at Metaxas for a long time. But trying to Mm -hmm. sort of consolidate and whatnot, I am generally known more as Lore Merchant than I am Metaxas. And so I have updated my Twitter handle is now at Lore Merchant, L-O-R-E-M-E-R-C-H-A-N-T. Again, if you Mm -hmm. are already following me on Twitter, there's nothing that you need to worry about. Nothing changed. But don't tag me with at Metaxas anymore. I am not. It ain't going to work. Yeah, it's it's not going to work. It is at Lore Merchant. (coughs) So there's... Little bits of news and, and housekeeping and stuff. And we're okay with that. So this was our mosaic episode. If there's a little slight wrinkle to the rules you think we should have covered and missed, 
that's fair. Uh, I had a longer list, but I think we can save a couple of those things for a fuller in-depth in-depth discussion that might warrant its own podcast or half podcast. We'll go from there. But I figure this is to help everybody kind of flesh out fully the options and possibilities for their characters and or their game and or their campaign. Take your pick. But any further thoughts on anything we may have missed tonight, Josh? No, I think we are all set for another week. Cool. I thank you for your input. I'm pretty sure the listeners will thank you as well. I uh, wanted to make sure, again, all those were covered. So everybody has what they need. So folks, uh, until next time, it is time for you to go patchwork together your legend like this Mosaic episode. Good night, everybody. Good night.